Balake. Where is Balake at? My name's Blake. Do you want to go to war, Balake? I'm for real. A.A. Ron. A.A. Ron's right here, everyone. I'm joined today by Marilyn Honig. How's it going, Marilyn? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, you've been a part of the SPTV community for so long now, and uh, you and I have never done a chat on my channel. I know. <laughs> is crazy. And, you know, not only are you a part of the SPTV community, but you have, honestly, one of the most heartbreaking, uh, crazy stories of being raised in a cult, being involved in a cult later in life. And I just think it's a perfect subject for, for us to chat about. Um, and honestly, for, for, for on my end, for a couple of, for a couple of reasons that I want to mention just briefly, uh, <clears throat> and actually before I get too far into it, let me show everyone Marilyn's channel is Marilyn Honig coffee, cults and crafts. And, uh, you can find her over there and, uh, you, you do a ton of content. You do live streams regularly, right? Yes, pretty much uh, most days because uh, uh, this, this guy named AA Ron said uh, to grow your channel, you should go live every day. <laughs> And I got the AA Ron mic. So how, how am I sounding, guys? Okay. Yeah, your sound is spectacular. <laughs> I hope that the Shore MV7 guys uh, give you some kind of, you know, kickback. You'd think no? so. Do you have the USB connect? The, I've got the cheaper USB connector. Do you have like the D? Um, uh, there's another word for it. D. Um, With the interface the and all, whatever that. No, DSR, no, 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 DSLR. Just, I, I don't know. No, just plug it right in. I'm very retro. I still have Facebook. I don't have any of that Instagram, whatever. I don't, yeah, I'm still Facebook. <laughs> uh, so I'll tell you what, the two reasons that I was mentioning, and I hope I can remember the second because right now I can only remember the first. Uh, I, I've, I've mentioned on my channel when I talk about some of my um, path out of Scientology that even when I no longer believed any part of Scientology, I thought it was BS. I thought L. Ron Hubbard was a con man and all this stuff. It didn't occur to me how much I was still holding on to the fact that Scientology was, was at least a special form of BS. And I read Steve Hassan's book, Combating Cult Mind Control, and he tells his story of being recruited into the Moonies um, as a, a college age uh, young man and rising up through the Moonies and how he left. And I was surprisingly, surprisingly to me, utterly devastated uh, to realize while reading Steve's story that Scientology wasn't even special BS. It was garden variety BS. Same here. Yeah. And that so many of these high control groups are just have the exact same playbook, the exact same way of treating its members, of recruiting people, of controlling people. And it was devastating for me. And it was, I, I didn't realize how much I was holding on to that. And, you know, when I watch, documentaries about uh, like Nexium, for example, I'm just absolutely struck by yet again, how similar these cults are to each other. Yeah. And I feel like to a certain degree, I'm afraid to keep looking. I'm afraid <laughs> to keep finding out that they're all the same. And so I'm really, really interested to hear, uh, and afraid at the same time <laughs> to hear about your experience. Um, and the second reason is actually a lot of people ask, or maybe it's just me that wonders, like, what is it that really resonates about stories of former Scientologists with, you know, the world at large who's never had anything to do with Scientology? And, and right. so often the answer to that question is, um, you know, people who've had experiences just with abusive relationships seem to really resonate with stories of people who come out of high control groups because there's so many similarities in the in the experiences. Absolutely. And and I think since you yourself never personally had any involvement in Scientology and yet you've, you know, become a, a very integral part of the SPTV family, I think hearing your story would also help people understand what is it about people's experiences who've never had anything to do with Scientology that allows the story of former Scientologists to resonate with them. So maybe we can start out with me asking you that question. Okay. What was it about okay. um, stories you heard from former Scientologists that sort of made you go, uh oh, or this yeah. is something that really resonates with me? Yeah. Well, first of all, your your first uh, point about Scientology not being all that special, that's exactly what I went through because 
you know, when you're in a high control, especially, you know, the classic cult with, the, you know, all checking off all the boxes in Stephen Hassan's book about, you know, charismatic leader and, and all of the indoctrination, you are told from a young age that this is the truth, right? So thousands of cults out there, small ones like mine, Door of Hope with 50 people on um, max, all had the truth, right? So when you find out that everybody has the truth, realize probably nobody does, right? And so that was was really like, oh my God, like all these cults think they have a truth. I, and you know, we'll talk later how I escaped the cult. I didn't even really know that I was in a cult. I mean, it's ridiculous when you hear the stuff I went through. It's very much like a Sea Org type situation. I didn't even know. I didn't have the vocabulary, the understanding, and the words. So when I started watching, and I'm trying not to get emotional here, um, but I will. I know I will. I got tissues. Um, when I started watching Leah Remini in the aftermath with all y'all, right? All you OGs, as we, we call you. Um, I was just absolutely blown away. Week after week, I would cry through every single episode and um, so many things I could relate to. And this was what, 2017 through the 2019, I think. Um, I really started to deconstruct and, and unravel. And that's, I had been out of the cult for 10 years and I still didn't realize it was a cult. And I just remember, um, I don't remember the exact episode, but I was like, holy, I won't swear this early. <laughs> Holy crap. Um, I was, I was in a cult. Oh my God. That's what it was. It was a cult and it checked off all the boxes and it really helped me to start to really, um, understand what happened to me and understand that, um, there were, I wasn't alone, you know, and, uh, particularly you, Aaron, um, you know, losing, um, a sibling, I could, you know, relate to that as well. Because um, I was the youngest of seven children, and there's only one sibling left with us, and unfortunately, I, I don't get to see him. So um, I could really relate to that too. And I didn't lose my family because of a cult, but because of um, some really awful shit. Um, when um, I don't know if you wanted me to go into that, but that's that's the answer to your question. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I don't want you to go into anything you don't feel like uh, you're comfortable going into. So I'm not going to necessarily well, prompt you. You know, I have, I, I talked to um, the, my, my friend, the late Doug uh, Kramer about it. And um, he did a very um, lengthy, but very thorough. Uh, you made me feel very comfortable. So it, it is out there. I'm willing to tell you. I'm to the point where I can talk about it. Um I wasn't able to for many, many years, even utter uh, door of hope or that I was in a cult. I mean, I love this community because you can talk about it. Um, you can talk about anything. I do on my channel. Talk about every anything and everything, but kind of like Reese, but only only a little more about <laughs> about other cults too. But um, I, yeah, I couldn't even utter my um, my former cult leader's name. Her name was Marlene Sweeney. And now I love to say her name any chance I get because she deserves it and <laughs> she earned it just like David Miscavige. So uh, Marlene Sweeney and uh, Kelly made a, made a little uh, kind of a, a drinking vibing game that Doug and I used to do. <laughs> and so every time we say Marlene Sweeney or Zenu, Zenu Marlene, we, we imbibe. <laughs> and she would hate that. She would hate that. And she would hate what I crochet now too. <laughs> oh, she would? <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Because, okay. So, in the Pentecostal religion, I guess we'll get a little bit into that and I can tell more, you know, of my younger story. But, but real quick, if somebody wanted to hear yeah. your interview with Doug Kramer, if they just searched yeah. your name, Marilyn Honig and Doug Kramer or Marilyn Honig yeah. and Dazed But Not Confused, they would yeah. find you. Yeah. And it's also, like, it's on Doug's channel and it's on my channel. Um, if you, oh. you can find it pretty easy on my, yeah, he had me simul stream to my channel. Um, oh. you, you know, go to, go to Doug's too. And please, you know, watch as many videos as you can because they're great but um on my channel i have a playlist so if you go to my channel hit playlist it says my story and it's the two-part interview i did with doug so okay good so quick reminder everyone if you're just joining us uh marilyn's channel is marilyn honig coffee cults and crafts and um anything we don't discuss here you can definitely find in, in the other videos too oh yeah we talk a lot on there 
Yes. So okay, uh, so well, crocheting. crocheting. Oh my God. Okay. So uh, some of you might know me as the Xenu crochet lady. I, I don't have a Xenu today. Um, I just sent a full, I've been making full dolls, not just the bobblehead covers, but the full dolls. But um, I started, I, this was inspired by um, our friend, Laura FM. You know how, you know, she always wears goldenrod, right? Yeah. Oh, it's big. I got, I got to position it a little bit better. Okay. So um, yeah, I, I used to, so in, in um, fundamental charismatic Pentecostal circles, you have what's called an anointing or a calling. And uh, I my calling was to just be a, what they call a help me. And um, I would just sit in the corner and crochet and I would um, like swab the decks kind of like uh, kind of like in the Sea Org. Um, I had buckets and buckets of ammonia water and I would just wash like walls um, and floors and windows. We didn't have newspaper, but um, we I did all that. So I, I would sit in the corner and crochet and it really did help me stay semi-sane because everybody was literally losing their mind around me because of the, the horrible indoctrination. And uh, so now instead of crocheting blankets and help me type stuff like dishcloths and pot holders and sweaters, I crochet funny shit. <laughs> and uh, it's really it's really fun to do stuff with Scientology because uh, nobody knows what Door of Hope is. So, um, so I want to introduce you to somebody. This is uh, his name's Rodney. <laughs> he, what? He's a golden rod. He's a golden rod, and uh, <laughs> his wait, there's more. <laughs> and his this is serious business. His feet say SPTV. <laughs> I'm kind of attached to him. <laughs> He's sweet. Oh my god! It's so big. <laughs> What's well, a pillow? It's a pillow. You can cuddle with him. You know, Aaron. Seriously though, you can bring him on the plane. You can bring him on the plane. You can rest. You can rest your head. On his balls? It's I mean on his feet. <laughs> but, but just be careful because if you go like that, he might hit somebody and it does kind of hurt, honestly. It kind of hurts. So anyway, oh I'll put this God. thing away. But he is happy to see everybody. Just so wow. You know. so I'm gonna <clears> that away. sorry. So yeah. <laughs> so Marlon Winnie would be horrified to know that I do that now. <laughs> The comments in the live chat right now. I, I'm not even looking. I'm just pretending <laughs> I'm in my living room or I'm in my little spot talking to Aaron. Oh my God. Are you okay? Um, I think I'm okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. So that oh. happened. So that happened. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. So the cult leader would be a little annoyed at that. <laughs> yes, just a little. Just a little. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Let's, for right now, um, skip the early life because I don't okay. know that either you or I are prepared Can to handle it for that right yeah. now. Yeah. <clears throat> the yeah, door really of hope cult. Oh, oh, I wanted to say this. When you say... Um, that like it was years and years and years later and, and it wasn't until you're like watching the aftermath that you're like oh my god i was in a cult it's funny i know there's going to be people watching who like how can you be in a cult and not know you're in a cult and i just want to say there's not a scientologist walking the earth all 16 of them who think they're in a cult <laughs> like no scientologist they think they they think it's the furthest thing from a cult you could possibly possibly be yeah um yeah and nobody joins a cult. Nobody, nobody thinks no. they're joining a cult and no one who's in one thinks they're in one. No, and right. even Scientologists or especially Scientologists at some point, and it's usually never when they're still in Scientology, come to the realization that like, oh, no, our group was one of those. And you're yeah. like, yeah, your yeah. group, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So how did you, what, what led you, what circumstances okay. contributed to you joining this group? Uh, of only 50 people, that's, it's remarkable. 
Yeah. And there's thousands. And I live in Vermont. There's tons of them. I live in um, the south, you know, southern half of Vermont, right near Massachusetts. But uh, you skip over the, quote, cities, um, which are very small, Rutland and Burlington, the northwest or the north um, northern kingdom, I think they call it, uh, near Canada, cult city, too. It's all cult. It's just, yeah, they love it. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm something in the water. Like, what, what's the deal? I think it's because, well, there's a little rhyme in Vermont. Do what you want. So, um, you know, it's just you're in kind of the green mountains and mm. you just do whatever you want. There's there's Catholic militias. There's yoga, cults, tons of yoga cults. I don't know if anyone has seen um, the Mother God documentary. Holy crap. I covered it with my friend Ash from that So Fucked Up podcast. And it was just wild. And, and I was like, wait, they went they they uh, like fled after you know 17 of them got arrested it was small cult too 30 people i think um there's thousands of those thousands and that's one reason why i want to get the word out because um you know scientology they got tom cruise and all that i got marlene sweeney she looks like a she looks like a female version of keith ranieri and she's just very school marmy unassuming but she had like that real book smart charisma you know and there's mm. There's thousands of them. And uh, the Pentecostal uh, religion, well, Pentecostal sect, um, or it's not, I don't want to consider it a cult, but I consider it very culty. So I was basically groomed as a child. Um, I came out of a uh, horrific background, uh, a lot of trauma, a lot of loss. And, um, you know, like I said, you could see my story on my channel, but um I was adopted by a Pentecostal charismatic family. By charismatic, I mean speaking in tongues, um, casting out demons. We didn't have snakes because snakes don't like to live in the, in the north. So thank God because I hate snakes. But um, yeah, it was all that. It was the fake healing. Well, healings um, and yeah, all that. So the worst thing about it to me, the culty thing about it was... Um, as a as a fire survivor who had suffered second and third degree burns, I was told that if I didn't measure up, I was going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever in hell. And I always felt like I was going to hell because I could never measure up. You know, I never I never had like I still to this day, it's like never felt like I had, um, you know, moral, traditional, spiritual values. I, I don't I just can't do it. I, I try but I just can't. So I'm just like, throw it out with the bathwater. It's like, I just, you know, I just try to be a good person and love people and help people. And, you know, I, I'm a little rough, rough around the edges, you know, I like, what can I say? So, um, it was hard being a cult member, but I was, I was basically like, this is, this is what you're doing. And so, um, as far as like being groomed for it, it was, um, always this thing of, looming over me, you're going to go to hell if you don't get it right. And it was, um, you know, a, a very strict uh, upbringing. And, and I was, I was a mess when I arrived in the foster home, because um, I had uh, been in the hospital for many months after losing my mom, and three siblings, and um, no one, like, wanted me or could deal with, like, I just, I couch hopped for four years until I was almost nine. And then finally, um, and I suffered a lot of abuse, but finally DCF, or we called it DCF back then, um, took me and put me in a foster home with nine other children. It was 10 of us. And I was like, kind of like a number. I mean, you just jumped in the van, went to church three, four times a week. Um, did what you, you know, did what you were told you were seen and not heard. And so when I was a teenager, I was still going to public school, but we were supposed to be in the world, but not of it. Right. So you you go to school, but you weren't allowed to go to dances, hang out with friends, watch movies, no music. So no rock even in the music. foster home, it was was this. A, it sounds like it was a religious foster home. Absolutely. It was Pentecostal. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. And my my adopted mom, I mean, they tried their best. They're good people. But my adopted mom was basically what they say, born on the pew, uh, like her uncle founded the church and it was an assemblies of God. And I'm not knocking mainstream religion. I'm not knocking Christianity as a whole, but these people were what they call holy rollers. And, um, I'd go in and people would be frothing at the mouth, getting demons cast out of them, getting like, um, healings where people, you don't know it's small town. People come in with a wheelchair and then leave jumping up and down. Like, I don't know these people. Like, 
is it staged? I don't know. But uh, all this stuff. And the worst thing was we were indoctrinated into, as a child, even in a quote, mainstream-ish church, that um, if that Jesus was coming back any day, they stopped saying the date because the date would come and go. <laughs> kind of like the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? So um, <clears throat> I remember being 10 or 11 years old watching this series in church on a pew watching the scary movie. It was called A Thief in the Night. And it was about, um, it was 70. So I was like, don't, don't go back and watch it. Cause it's so bad. And it's scary too, as a child watching us where the rapture came and that meant when, um, Jesus came back and took his people, I was always going to miss the rapture. I knew it. So whenever I was in like the, the grocery store with my, with my adopted mom or my adopted siblings, and you know, you, you lose track of them in the store. Oh God, the rapture came. Oh shit. I missed it. I missed, I didn't say shit back then, but I missed it. Right. So what would happen if you miss the rapture? This, I laugh about it now, but it was so scary because you miss the rapture. You're on your own. If you don't take 666, and this is in the Bible, on your, on your um, hand or your my oh, right hand or your forehead, it's all backwards here. Um, if you don't take that, then, um, you, okay, so if you take it, you can buy and sell and you can live, right? Until the tribulation comes and you'll end up um, going to hell because you have you have the mark of the beast on your um, your right hand or your forehead, okay? Okay, you got that? Got that part? But if you want, if you don't want to go to hell, which I didn't because I didn't want to burn, I'd already burned some and it was terrible, right? Um, so you do that, but then you will be, um, I don't know if I can say it. Go ahead. Uh, beheaded beheaded for um the for the gospel of christ because you missed the rapture but you can still go to heaven if um you get beheaded so i was like i used to think and i, I used to think about it at night like okay try to figure this out right so the rapture is probably going to happen i'm going to get left behind so i want to get 666 but then i'll burn to death or or not to that forever and ever right or do i get my head chopped off and then i still go to heaven and I try to think as a 10 year old, what that would feel like. I'm like, I hope they put a bag over my head. Like it was that bad. It was that. Yeah. Oh Seriously. God. This is the shit that kids. And, and I've talked about this on my channel and so many people were like, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, I felt that too, but they were like afraid to say it right as a kid. So I used to think, oh, what would it feel like? And then you go to heaven and you're supposed to get a new body, but your, your body's supposed to be risen. So do I do I show up at the pearly gates with no with no head? Like is it under my arm? And then you don't you don't get a mansion because you didn't make the rapture. So <clears throat> you end up. I take it back. This is much worse than Scientology. No, it's not. <laughs> yes, it is. Because they don't have PIs. <laughs> Well, and this was the mainstream church, Erin. This is like not not mainstream Christianity, but mainstream Pentecostal, Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism. I don't like Pentecostalism. I'm not calling it a cult, but it, you guys, you guys just decide what you think about Pentecostalism, okay? And this was oh this was yeah, um yeah. You guys know who's that guy in Growing Pains? He did the the next um one Kirk left behind. Cameron. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a clown too. Is, but anyways, is he a Pentecostalist? I would Pentecostal? call him. I would call him a holy he, roller. I don't know. Or is he evangelical? I don't know the difference. Yeah, to be honest, definitely evangelical. Um, so evangelical is. <clears throat> I would. I would consider all Pentecostals evangelical, but not all <clears throat> evangelicals are Pentecostal. So Pentecostal is more extreme. Yes, and and evangelical is more of an umbrella. You know. Okay. Yeah. So. So yeah, so that's what I came out of. So when I was a teenager, um, I got, you know, this was the 80s. I liked Madonna and Prince and I wanted to listen to rock music. Oh, no, no, no. And I really wanted to go to prom. Oh, no, no, no way, right? So um, the only way I got to listen to rock music um, when I was about 15, 16 was backwards because you go to church and they would take like, um, the Eagles Hotel California and, and all these um, albums that I really was fascinated with. But we listened to them backwards because they were supposed to say something about the devil. So mm. like they just, they let us, they only let us listen to rock music backwards because it's supposed to um, scare you, scare, scares you straight. Right. So it would be like, you know, it goes zhub, 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 and they'd be like, listen, that says um, you love the devil or the devil is great or something. And I'm like, I don't hear it. It's just saying zhub, 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 like whatever. So I would get scared, like another panic attack in the middle of the night. So, when I was 17, I just decided, you know what? I'm going to go to hell anyways. I might as well have fun doing it. So I ended up running away. 
<laughs> ended up in a troubled teen um, home for a few weeks. Ended up in a pretty good foster home until I graduated from high school. Got to go to prom. I ran away so I could go to prom, pretty much. Um, and then I was out on the street again. And I was couch hopping because I had um, aged out of the foster system. So I uh, decided to to uh, escape to just uh, take off to Cape Cod and kind of sow my oats and just spend a couple years on the Cape, just, you know, having fun and couch hopping again and, you know, working and between jobs, whatever. And then I was really going to hell, <laughs> really, because I had had way too much fun on Cape Cod. So uh, my parents invited me to come back home. <laughs> at 20 years old and the, with these are the the pentecostal parents foster yes. parents yes yeah okay yeah and they knew i was struggling i mean i had no i had no support system but it was always like um i i had backslid and i was an apostate you know i don't know if you've ever heard that term it's like an sp like you're an apostate right? scientology started using this term because because the courts uh, anyway, anyway, yes. Scientology uses the term former That's a disgruntled term. apostates. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they steal a lot from the Bible. Like um, the the one, uh, what's what's the Sea Org slogan? We come Not, back. The other the other one. Many are called. Few are chosen. Oh, many, many are, are called. Few are, chosen. few are chosen. That's from the Bible. Yeah. Oh, oh, really? Just saying. Yeah. Did I ever? Uh, you know, when I um <clears throat> got out of the Sea Org or whatever, and I would see bumper stickers that said, "What would Jesus do?" I was like, they stole our slogan. <laughs> because in Scientology, the slogan is, what would Ron do? Really? Yeah. I don't know which came first. Maybe maybe they stole it from Ron. <laughs> we got to give the guy something. We got to give him something. <clears throat> I don't know. So, okay. So, yes, I, I went back home um, kind of very apprehensive because I knew I was going to end up having to go back to church. But my adoptive mom said, um, oh, no, 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 you, you know, we obviously I would have to go to church, but no, 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 um, we, we, we joined a new church. And remember uh, Marlene Sweeney, she was a Sunday school teacher. She's a Bible teacher. She doesn't do all that crazy, you know, like seeking and touch, which I found out later she did just quite more quiet, more evil about it. But um, she doesn't do all that sensational stuff, you know, slaying in the spirit and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, we're going to roll up our sleeves and learn about God. So I was like, okay. And um, Marlene was a, a, was a devout, fo devout follower of um, this guy um, named Bill Gothard. He, he uh, started the IBLP, Institute and Basic Life Principles, and uh, he believed in the umbrella of authority. I don't know if anybody recognizes that name, but it was the cult that the Duggars follow. Wow. And uh, yeah, so uh, she just basically had uh, did a spinoff from the Pente Pentecostal Church, and I call I call Door of Hope a pe petri dish cult. So it was a little bit of charismatic, fundamental, Pentecostal, IBLP, all mixed together. So basically, you have an authoritarian, uh, mystical, like crazy shit church, and they were really into you know the umbrella of authority, but also this really strange. Um, like prophetic thing where only Marlene could hear from God, you know? Wow. And uh, I didn't know what God's will was. I was always navel gazing. I was always beating myself over the head and, and crying out to God. So I was like, I didn't know what was the devil. What was my sin nature? What was God? What was myself? What was the, this? But Marlene knew what, what God's will was because she was a student of the Bible and a prophetess in a prophetess. So, um, she, about a year after I went home, uh, I started, you know, working and everything. And she, she started a live in discipleship ministry and started renting this big old inn, um, like in Vermont, you know, she was from Long Island. She called it Long Island. Um, and you know, everyone's dream, you know, in Long Island is like, let's go start a bed and breakfast in Vermont. Right. And they have no idea what they're doing. Like they don't know. I don't know if you ever saw baby boom with uh, as a Diane Keaton. It's hilarious. Like she, she, you know, rented this, this bill or she bought this building and had no idea where the water came from or how to fix anything. So, uh, Lucky for her is that Marlene decided to glean 
or pluck out different people from different um different assemblies of God's church churches and people that were 20 something 30 something that could do her bidding and it was basically um the hell began when we all moved in wow can I ask one question what is the Absolutely. umbrella of authority what is the umbrella of authority Okay, so the umbrella of authority was one of the main teachings that uh, Bill Gothard slash the Duggars uh, guru had had um, come up with. Right, he was uh, he had like this kind of pseudo military thing too, where he'd have like camps. You know, a lot of cults do do that. So I kind of like the Sea Org. They'd have they'd have these people that really meant business with the religion, right, and really wanted to make a difference. So. The umbrella of authority was basically like um, there's God is the ultimate authority, but who knows what God wants, the pastor or the, the leader, right? So you're under this umbrella and there's a hierarchy. So there's God, the leader, the men, the elders. It was very, very um, patriarchal which I'll tell you why Marlene got away with being this way, being a woman. Um, and then the women, the wives, and then the children. And this umbrella of authority was, if you think of it this way, you stay under um, that covering of umbrella of authority of what, what your husband, your pastor, ultimately God wants. Um, or if you go out of the umbrella of authority, it's going to rain on you or all like terrible things are going to happen to you. And guess what? You're going to pull in a lot of shit. You pulled it in. <laughs> That's what it is. Yes. So, <clears throat> so I want to, yeah. I want to throw something out there and guys, I'm not watching the live chat, but p please feel free to let me know what your thoughts on this are. <clears throat> Back in the 60s and the 70s, Scientology was not as militant and strict and structured and yeah. puritanical as it has, has become. And I just suspect <laughs> that people who have been steeped in the type of religious beliefs that you're talking about and were prone to want, uh, you know, uh, wanted to believe in something greater than themselves, some greater purpose, some greater meaning, some greater plan, that those people back then when encountering Scientology I think it's quite possible that Scientology just filled a need that they had and actually, and this is what I'm uh, hesitate to say, made a little bit more sense. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I want people in the live chat to let me know. Because <laughs> I know when people hear about Xenu and shit, they're like, ain't nothing right, about right. that makes sense. That didn't even, there was no such thing as Xenu in the 60s. Right. Right. Z L. Ron Hubbard didn't even come up with OT3 until like 1967 so, or something. Are you saying like it this. made more sense early on? Or, yes, because it was okay, it was yeah. just self helpy. It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't right. God, yeah. heaven, mm -hmm. hell. You know, um, right. uh, it, there was none of that. Um, none of your staples of religious belief, but it still appealed to sort of a higher power, even though the higher power was you. Right. You're the higher power. Anyway, I'm just speculating yeah. that perhaps in the late fifties, early mid sixties, yeah. it's one of the things that helped Scientology grow is that it appealed yeah. to people who wanted something greater and just might have made a little bit more sense. Right. Well, was, just, wasn't it called like more of a science, like the science of mental health? So, the so technology? Dianetics, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. He's always said it's a technology and it's not something you believe. It's something you do. And Dianetics was a science. Scientology was almost immediately kind of being a, a, a more spiritual spiritual philosophy. I feel like L. Ron Hubbard used spiritual and religious interchangeably when it was convenient. But mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, my memory, I'm, I'm not great with dates. I think he jumped into Scientology in 54. Dianetics, I know, was 50. Right. Scientology, I think, came about more like 54. And he didn't even get into the Xenu stuff until like 67. And even then, almost nobody knew about it because almost nobody gets up to the OT levels. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. Right. Yeah. Because people go, holy shit. What does Scientologists believe? I'm listening to this shit and I'm like, holy shit. I know like Xenu, like, oh my God, I had, we have, we have pretty much equivalents for everything, you know? And, I wish and I if there's any ex-Scientologists, <laughs> yeah, if there's any ex-Scientologists, I was doing this with Doug. We had, I have notes and notes of different comparisons of the language of the crazy, you know, the demon shit. You, you had body thetans. Uh, can I, can I flash this for my, my friend, Clearwater Cheryl? This yeah. is, she sent me this body thetan. Oh my God. And I'm telling you guys, I've crocheted for 42 years and she is the best crocheter. Look how uniform her stitches are. So Clearwater Cheryl, but body thetans, I had them all over me, but they were demons, you know?
Wow. Yeah. When you hear Scientology's um, <clears throat> or L. Ron Hubbard's story of Zeno and the body things, do you think he just purely stole that from a, a demonic, demonic possession? I, I don't know. You know, it, it's really funny because I, I don't know as these guys are that smart like even marlene like they had this there's this hidden handbook somewhere like how to become an evil maniacal cult leader and they all follow it to the t only with different language only with different words and it's like how do they effing know this right but i think it's just something in a call it i, I mean i'm no doctor i'm no psychologist but narcissistic psychopaths pretty much have the same you know tendencies. And I think he was just ramping up the pressure. I don't think he um, was like, okay, whoo, how can I deceive all these thousands of people? I'm going to start by making sense. And I'm going to, but I don't know how it happens, but it does start by making sense. Just like how I got into the cult. I was, you know, I was groomed from eight and a half, nine years old. And I knew, you know, God was the way, right? And it got worse and worse and worse. And all of a sudden, you know, I lost 40 pounds, didn't, you know, didn't need to, I mean, back then I didn't need to, but I was skin and bones. I was, um, you know, constantly just losing my mind. Everybody around me was being hospitalized. We were, you know, we were starving. We were desperate. We were, you know, I was just carrying buckets of ammonia water, just breathing all this crap in and all for the cause of what? And when it, when it started, not to skip ahead in my thing, but um, I have this uh, mama bear mug. This is what saved my life. And you know what? We, we left with our kids once, once Marlene started to, um, not only, um, it's called, it was called laying hands on us and casting out demons, not only accusing me of having demons, but my seven year old daughter who is, you know, light of my life. Um, Marlene Sweeney decided that she was a Jezebel and had a demon of Jezebel in her and, uh, proceeded to do two exorcisms on her. And honestly, Erin, it took me two more years, it took me, my husband, who many of you that follow my channel have met my, my husband, who was a sweetheart, really good person, but we were indoctrinated. It took two years to escape. But I tell you, um, we left with our children. I, we didn't save our children. Our children saved us, you know? Wow. wow. Because I could take a lot leave? of abuse. So we still. Honestly, I still live um, less than five miles away, and uh, Marlene's 85 now. She's still waiting for the end times of Jesus to come. Hasn't happened yet. Um, she's dying of cancer, I heard. But uh, the way we were able to leave, it took a while, but we basically we were called before um, uh, Door of Hope. It has a um, equivalent of a, a comev. And it was basically like we've discerned that um, you are being um, you have hidden rebellion in your heart. It wasn't hidden at that point. I was just like, this sucks, you know, but um, it was the abuses. It wasn't the it wasn't necessarily the beliefs. And I see that with Scientology, too. It was because she was just, you know, bearing down hard and mistreating all of us horribly and being a goddamn hypocrite. Right. Sorry, I just take the Lord's name in vain, but, um, yeah, she's just being a, a darn hypocrite. And so we just, she wanted to come and lay hands on me one day in my house. And I told Duncan, um, don't let her come. And I had a full on panic attack, like literally right in that corner right there. And, uh, he said, I won't, I won't, I won't, I promise. I promise. I won't let her come. And, um, he said no for the first time in 16 years. We'd been in for 16 years. And we had done everything, everything she said. We, were, we weren't even allowed to hold hands before we got married. And uh, like, yeah, we, she controlled everything, where we went, you know, what we did, everything. And we, are, we were married. My husband's almost 12 years older than me. So he was 38 when we got married. I was 26. We hadn't even held hands hardly. I think we snuck and held hands and kissed once. But yeah, it was like that. I know I'm bad. I'm really bad. We kissed. Oh um, my goodness. So it was like, then it was like populate the earth, right? You do, you go from nothing. I don't know if you got, anybody knows what courting is. We barely courted, right? And and good thing we had both sold our oats as youth. So we knew where everything went. So we had, uh, we had three kids like that, like, <laughs> and then, uh, I had really difficult pregnancies and, uh, I got special permission to stop having children. I think mostly because my daughter Marlene had it out for her. 
and uh, she was three and a half years old. And when my youngest was, was, was born and she was like, I think she didn't want any more little Marilyn's running around. Cause she just did not like my daughter. <laughs> so she gave me permission not to have, and I know it sounds really crazy. It sounds like you're stupid for, for doing that. You know, like, I know I look back now and I'm just like, now I just tell her to, you know what, but I, I, back then it was just years and years and years. I had just been worn down and broken down and you just go, right. You just kind of don't know what so to do. It's incredible. It really is incredible. So you look back on it now and you realize it was a cult. How would you describe what you thought it was then? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, I thought, and this is going to sound really crazy, but I thought that we were um, like special, like um, we were told that we were like the remnant and we had the truth. We had the inner um, secret, like we were like the OTs, you know, we were like, we're special. And um, the parishioners, like we were basically there to serve the parishioners, but we were sort of looked up to in a way too, even though we were like everybody was just turning a blind eye to the abuses that were going on. Right. But, um, yeah, we were, we thought that we had the truth and I couldn't, didn't feel like I could live without it until it became a point where I would rather die. You know, I'd rather yeah. die. And, and I had to get out and I knew I was going to hell anyway. So again, just like when I was 16, I, I ran away. It was like me and my kids, we were told that if we left, and we had that comment thing. We had that tribunal sitting there and people that I loved, people that I had pretty much spent, I, I had no family or friends outside of them, right? They all looked at the floor and they just let her condemn us. And I was afraid of this back then, but I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I can't, I have a really dark sense of humor and I just can't help it. But um, Marlene told me that my kids and Duncan and I were going to end up on the dung heap, like D-U-N-G, the shit pile. And I was like, I mean, now I'm like, oh, no, not the dung heap. But the dung heap meant that you would just be cast away. You'd be burned up. God would condemn you. And so I'm sitting five miles away, right, with them going by. And I'm like, when we left, I was so scared of the dung. I don't even know what the dung heap was. But back then, I didn't want to go there. Now I am on the dung. Now I'm on the shit pile. And y'all are great. I like she was like the people out on the dung, the dung heap are the most the worst people, but she is just such a horrible person that everybody looks great compared to her. So wow. it was again, like those evil, you know, I don't say the W word, um, but uh, yeah, those blasted never ends. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, the W uh, word. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah no. Um, the dung heap would be a great name for a channel or a podcast. <laughs> Now, you mentioned the parishioners a moment ago. When you yep. said there was 50 people in the group, yep. is that yep. include the parishioners? Yeah. Well, there was, there were, I mean, literally there were hundreds that kind of came and went, but there were 50 regular. So, um, so in the heyday, when we were all living there before I got married, there were at, at one time about 12 of us, like 12 disciples, like Jesus said, mm -hmm. Jesus had 12 disciples. Uh, we lived on the second floor. And again, you know, not, not plug in, you know, my channel, but I'm just saying I do have all, all of that. And I think on the thumbnail, the thumbnail that you put up, Aaron, um, has the door of hope in, that was the inn. it was, they called it the old coach Inn. it was built in the late 1700s and it was part of the underground railroad and it was a beautiful building, but it was so much work. And my, my husband did a lot of the maintenance and it was like, I had to clean top to bottom. So we were basically there to fast and pray and, um, Dunk calls it navel gazing, like, uh, looking within. Um, and that reminds me of a lot of that, like auditing the repentance. There's so many parallels. Um, and I would love to dig into that with, with an ex-Scientologist, if anybody's interested that has a channel that wants to talk about that stuff. <clears throat> you know, it's funny in some references, L. Ron Hubbard would, um, mockingly refer to, religious scholar types as contemplating one's navel. And I never understood what the heck he was talking about. It just seemed like a funny phrase for doing something pointless. Uh, is that actual, what is that? Is that an actual phrase that actually refers to something? Well, specific? you know, they talk about like bell, belly button. It, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of a, a, a slang, like a vernacular, but um, you know, 
in new age they, they talk about like navel gazing like looking within you know um it's uh like yeah it's like kind of staring at your belly button like looking inside of you because but literally if they can um not really we didn't have to actually look at our belly button we we had to like um lay um i want to say the word right because there's a lot of bad ways to say it, uh prostrate before god where you're literally on your <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Not ways prostrate. to say it wrong well yeah yeah so you would literally lay on your face before god <laughs> it's in the bible it's in the bible um so you lay on your face and you're just crying out to god about what a terrible person you are Right. And uh, we had what was called instead of a reactive mind, we had a sin nature. You were born bad because, you know, people that, and I'm not making fun of the Bible or Christianity, guys. But I'm just saying if you take the Bible literally right word for word, which is hard to do because there's a lot of contradictions. But if you believe that the earth is only a few thousand years old or however many thousand years old and the reason why babies are born bad, people are born with a sin nature that needs a savior, Jesus Christ, right? Um, that we took it literally that Adam um, and Eve were naked in the garden. They took uh, the serpent, which is the devil, Lucifer, that was fallen. He tempted Eve with an apple. Eve, it's all the woman's fault. Eve gave Adam the apple. They ate the apple and then presto, everybody's born a sinner. So you were born a sinner. And so you need a savior. Now you're okay. If you die um, as a child before the age of accountability, not sure when that is. I think it's around eight, nine. Um, then you'll, you'll still go to heaven because you don't know any better, right? Even though you were born a sinner. After that, now, now get this. I was eight and a half, nine years old when I joined the, the culty called T church. Right. So I was always going to hell because I could never, never measure up. Right. So, so they, so they believe, they believe that they take, they take the Bible totally literally. So, um, that's pretty much screws you because then you're working for your salvation for the rest of your life. And I know that mainstream Christians believe that G Jesus saved you and that's it, you know, but there's all these things that we had to do to earn our salvation. So that's what we wow. were fasting. We were fasting. We were praying. We were we were studying. We were listening to these indoctrination, hellfire and brimstone all the time. And we would sit in at night after working and pretty much starving and doing all this this heavy labor to keep you busy. Right. We would have to like look again about the looking within, always trying to find a demon inside of you or some bad thing, um, some bad thought, everything. So it would literally people went insane. I unfortunately recruited two of my friends into the cult and uh they both were well one of them was hospitalized and the other one still there um he was just a good friend uh growing up and uh, he ended up marrying marlene's niece and he's still on the board they called it um, the ones that do the tribunals and uh yeah he lost his mind he fasted for 10 straight days and was found um wandering in the back road hallucinating and uh, I do talk to his mom sometimes. She's still like, oh, that place was a cult. I can't stand her. She's so glad I'm speaking out, you know, on behalf of people because she's like, people need to know that Marlene Sweeney of Vermont is, of Door of Hope, is not a good person and has done a lot of damage. Wow. Yeah. You know, people ask all the time, why don't the authorities step in and do stuff about Scientology? And there's various, you know, answers to that question. In your opinion, and, and of course, there's religious protections that exist yep. in the United yep. States that are different than even what exists yep. outside of the United States. In your opinion, are there crimes being committed in this group that the police could or should take action against? Or is it all just uh, just religious <sighs> belief and practice? Yeah. Um, if you call, um, you know, horrible corporal punishment, let me find it. Um, all right, guys, it's on the bottom of my pile. Um, this horrible book, this has the, the infamous blanket training. This was our um, child training Bible. It's nothing but absolute disgusting abuse. And this was used by the Duggars. And it was um, also our child training Bible. Um, I was happy to have, like, I always wanted to be a mom. I didn't really have a mom, but um, I loved my children so much. And I, my main reason I got in trouble is because I wouldn't do a lot of this shit, right? I did spank him with a wooden spoon, um, which I regret, but this is like utter torture. This is torture. And um, I think this, this 
people following this should be arrested. Absolutely arrested. It's disgusting. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I did I did a little book report again on my channel. Uh, one of my first my first videos ever ever. And uh, it's just it's horrible. So that's one that's one thing. Um, the reason why you don't hear of thousands, literally thousands of these micro cults all over the world and, you know, all over the U.S. and Vermont, um, Oregon, where else do they like to hang out? Hawaii, uh, everywhere. Um, the reason you don't hear about them is because when do you hear about them? Like Mother God, she was mummified and there were crimes and there were like it, it gets to the point where, yeah, that happened. But they're they're all hiding they're hiding in the hills wow you know? and that's why um, Dorf Hope hasn't hasn't come to that yet but i don't want it to you know wow based on the story about adam and eve and eating the apple and all the evil basically came from that <laughs> is there any rules against eating apples no <laughs> i don't think so i think it was actually a pomegranate or maybe a person <laughs> i'm hooked on pomegranates these days yeah that's so my new food yeah fad. you can't be no so you can't be a pentecostal i'm sorry Sorry oh, about that, Lord. Aaron. I eat an unhealthy amount of pomegranate. <laughs> really? Do you eat the seed? Like, well, how do you? What do you do? Do you drink? Well, that's what I you like eat. Juice. That's what you do eat. Like you crunch the seeds. Like oh the, yeah. The middle. Um, I mean, I'll have like a sprinkling. You know, I'll like you, you order something restaurant, and I'll eat a few of them. But I, I want to kind of like hog down like an entire pomegranate worth. I'll eat like a pound or two. They're delicious. Oh, just the seeds. They are delicious. Yeah. Uh, I'll mix the seeds into yogurt. You know, oh, put some right. pistachios in there. There's fiber. Like yeah, because, you know, the, ju the juice, you know, in that little, what's that bottle? Palm, wonderful or whatever. Palm. Yeah, yeah, palm. Um, that's, you know, it kind of, there's no fiber, so it kind of goes to sugar in your That's right. It's system. basically soda. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I've never understood about all the different branches of Christianity is, and it's funny because in Scientology, there's only one Scientology. Yeah, right? yeah. I've just never understood how I'm like, so you guys all have the same book and all yeah. hundred or uh, hundreds of you different groups think you're the one doing it right. And everyone mm -hmm. else is doing it wrong. And I just go, what yeah. is the statistical likelihood that your one true interpretation and practice is the one that's going to get you where you want to go. And everyone else is making a mistake. And I've never really been able to wrap my head around that. But my question for you, setting up the question for you is, what was the story in your group for why your leader had the one correct interpretation of the way you were supposed to live and the practices you were supposed to follow? And did you think mm -hmm. everyone else was going to hell? Um, well, she called everyone else what she called carnal Christians, which means like of the flesh. They're not really doing it right. They're not in the spirit. They might they might end up in heaven. They might end up in have he headless slum heaven, like I felt like I was going to. But um, they, yeah, uh, I think that it was so slow, but so powerful, and we all like you weren't supposed to go to any other church. Yeah, it was um. Towards the towards the end of us leaving, um, it, we started to question in our minds, right? Especially after she did that to our children, because we we're like, "What loving God would would do that to a child?" You know. So we started we started to think about it, but we still had the indoctrination. Like it was the abuses that made us leave, not really necessarily the beliefs. But we did join other churches, and some of those, you know, the the church where we joined ended up being kind of hypocritical, and we were like, we just kind of was like, "We're not doing that." You know, but I think that um, it was that appeal of um, let's get serious with God. Like it appeals to your um, your your wanting to make a difference in the world. And then we realized we weren't we weren't doing anything. We weren't even talking to anybody in the world. How are you? How are you saving? You know, um, the the God's to, how are you saving um, mankind as you as Scientology would say we weren't doing anything I was just washing toilets with my bare hands that was not saving anything right but we were very idealistic and another thing you know that a reason I, I like to speak out about this is because there's levels of it too and there's also um, certain ages and certain um, people that do kind of buy into this. Um, I was 20. I was kind of between, I didn't have a career or a family really, or anything going on. And I really wasn't, you know, it wasn't like under my parents, like you know, things like colleges, colleges are, 
or ripe, uh, you know, um, what do you talk recruiting grounds, recruiting grounds. So really? yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. That's, that's uh, one of the Just because ages. it's young people or is there another well, reason? Yeah, there's another reason because you're kind of out, you're out from, um, you know, your parents' supervision or whatever. You're an adult, you're an adult, but you haven't really like, I mean, I was very idealistic and very, a little rebellious, you know, and um, I was like, oh, this sounds, this sounds interesting. I think that's why a lot of the the parents of the second gens probably got into sci Scientology in this, in the seventies and eighties, because it was like, oh, this is something that makes sense. Right. And then they start, and then all of a sudden they're they're hearing about Zeno and stuff. They're what four hundred thousand dollars in, in so many years you get that equity rescue or whatever whatever they call it, where we can't leave now. You know, this is our whole life. So you get the cognitive dissonance. I guess the the short answer to your question would be, um, um, you get to where you can you can believe two things at once, and you just rationalize it, you know, mm -hmm. and ignore it. Right. Yeah. Tell me again the name of um, the Door of Hope cult leader. Marlene Sweeney. Marlene I like to say her name. Sweeney. Yes. yes. So, yes. so you said before that um, <clears throat> you guys believe that Marlene had a direct connection to God, like she could talk to God. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um. She, yeah, she would talk through scriptures, or she would go um up on the mountain like Moses. Like she she liked to reenact the Old Testament. And uh, she would go up to this uh, mountain. Well, it was actually a nice resort that we paid for, but it was in the mountains. But she would hear from God and she would come back and tell tell us uh, what God said. And it was usually that we were really bad and we, were, we weren't measured up, measuring up. Um, we were weighed in the balance. So we didn't have, we didn't have like, we had the Bible, right? But you could, you can interpret the Bible however you want. We didn't have um, advices and, and doctrine and all of those policy. We, we didn't have that. It was whatever Marlene felt like. It was kind of like, I don't know if you've um, ever watched any of the, uh, David Koresh Waco documentaries, he uh, would just yeah. decide, he would just decide, you know, one day everybody was just going to eat popcorn for dinner a week, a week. I like popcorn, but anyways, um, yeah. So I wouldn't want to join that, but I do like popcorn, but he would just decide that he was taking his, <laughs> he was, he was just going to take everybody's wives and have children with them. And it's like, okay, you know, there wasn't any, any, any book that, that said that. So that's what Marlene believed too. She was just pretty much pretty much wow. do that. And did you guys think that she was the only one in the world who could talk to God or just the only one of uh your group who could talk to God? Um she had she had um what I call minions. She had people that okay, I'll just give you an example. Um she would discern that um Marilyn, she always liked to pick on me. I don't know why. I was I was going before the board going for a comment all the time. And uh, she would discern that I had something that God gave her a word, but she wasn't really sure. But she had to have everybody lay hands on me. So she put me in a room and all the elders, usually five or six of them would stand around me. And um, I guess this was like, I don't know, probably not a touch assist, but sometimes they would lay on hand, hands out to heal you physically or whatever. Um, they'd put some, uh, what is that called? Well, we were, she was too cheap to buy real oil. It was more like um, Wesson. She would anoint your forehead. Your hair would be so greasy. Oh, I hated that. Had she, um, she, had she ever heard? Had she ever heard of Costco? Because there's some great deals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. How much is, is Western oil at Costco? Oh, at real olive oil. Yeah, wouldn't that be more Bible-y? like Bible-ish is olive oil. So I had Western oil on me and then she would lay hands on me and she would just start going under her breath, like speaking in tongues. She'd be, cause God would speak to her through that too. She'd, she'd be like, oh, it would be ticking like aliens around me. They'd be like, tick, 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 like that. And um, sometimes they would go, oh, da, 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 be healed. Da, like this crazy shit. Yeah. And I'm just shaking. Right. And then all of a sudden she'd become quiet. And she'd come in front of me and I'd see her. I'm like, I'm like, I can't help but open my eyes. She would open one eye and she'd say, and I, I don't want to mention any other person because they were victims too, but she would say, we'll call her Sally. She would say to one of the elders, this lady was like 75 years old and uh, she was retired and she gave all her money to, you know, her husband had died and had a pension, gave all her money to Marlene Sweeney. Um, 
And she would be sitting there and she'd say, Sally, um, I, God told me that you have a word for Marilyn. And she would just be like, and I kind of look over and she she's trying to come up with a word, right? And you could see the smoke come out of her ears. Like she has to have a word for Marilyn. And so she's like, um, I'm getting a word. I'm getting a word. Um, I think it's um um God told me a can. So Achan, suppose I had a spirit of Achan. Achan was this guy in the Bible that stole a bunch of idols and kept them under his tent. And um, the Israelites were losing the battles in, in the Old Testament. And so um, God condemned him. He ended up being thrown with all of his um, his his wives, his children, or however many wives he had, his children, all his belongings um, into this valley. And they were stoned and not in the fun way, stoned to death. And um, they uh, were burned up. And so, yeah, so I have that spirit in me. And again, it's like your family getting burned up. Thanks, Marlene. Thanks. You know, it's just, she didn't give, she didn't give a shit. She didn't give a shit. She just wanted to hurt me, you know, and that's okay. I let her hurt me until she started hurting my ch my children. You know, it's like, I realize I could take a lot of abuse, but don't hurt people I love. Don't hurt people I love and don't hurt any SBTV creators I love. I'm not yelling at you. I'm just saying. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, yeah. to me, someone who's never involved in that, it's always easier to, to feel that something you weren't involved in is. Yeah. And this isn't, something. this isn't typical. This isn't your everyday <clears throat> average Pentecostal church, but this was a sect. There's lots of sex and not the fun kind yeah. either. You know, well, I'll tell you, I see some of the stuff that well, um, some of these televangelists <laughs> do and I'm like, yeah, that's true. But Marlene believed what? in asceticism. Well, it's usually extremes, right? It's, extremes are bad. Um, she believed in celibacy. So we did get married, but like I said, you know, good thing we knew where things went, but we, it was, um, you're pure before God, you're celibate. Yeah. It was, no masturbation, no nothing like that. You couldn't even look at a person. It was just, it was just, yeah. So it's usually one extreme to the other. And usually the cult leader gets to do whatever they want anyways, right? That's how it goes. Right. Was she, uh, well, um, it's easier to imagine a, a male leader um, taking advantage of the members uh, physically. Did she do any of that? No. Um, no, I, not that I know of at all. It was more, um, she, okay. So this whole authoritarianism thing that she believed with, you know, Bill Gothard, um, she said the reason why, cause leadership is supposed to be male in the Bible. Um, according, mm. you know, if you, if you take it word by word, um, a lot of Christians don't believe that. And I, and that's great. And, you know, I know a lot of great Christians, but in this sect, it, this cult, it was, um, the reason why she could get away with this as a woman is because there's a few women in the Bible, like Deborah, who was a judge, a few women in the Bible that were anointed by God, that were used by used by God. A lot of words like being used, which I don't like to be used, guys, but that's what she always said. It was a good thing. So she was being used by God because there were no other men in like a hundred mile radius that could that God had anointed to do what she, you know, what she was led to be doing, right? and leading this flock. So she'd be like, I'm doing this for you. Oh, you rotten. Kind of sounds like Dave Miscavige. Just like, uh, you know, you guys are just, you know, doing the wrong thing all the time. And I can't believe. And she used to be a sweet lady when I first met her. And then she's just a, a screaming banshee all the time. We could never make her happy ever. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, um, to me again, because I was never involved in it. It's easy for me to hear how you're describing this. And, and I just go, that is just group delusion of, of, yeah. of um, the, you know, the leader throwing it over to someone else and someone else has to come up with something and they, 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 they're convincing themselves it's coming from God. And I immediately equated actually to what I believe in Scientology is a group delusion yeah. that is enforced on all the members about the effectiveness of these OT levels yeah. where you're telepathically counseling these spirits that you're told are stuck to you right. and then convincing yourself that you feel great as a result of doing it. And 
you know, yeah, you know why you feel that- great? You know why you feel great is because you you admit, okay, I have a spirit of Achan. I'm sorry, I have idols in my tent. I have, a, and then when you leave, when they let you out of that fucking room, you feel great because you're out of there. You're the, uh, like yeah. you confess. If you confess your sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive your sins, cleanse you from all right righteousness. You feel cleansed. So you, if you're sitting in a room, you know, casting out body things, and you and yeah, you you, you feel like what is that called, Kelly? You, Kelly told me her parents used to say when they, after they got out of uh, auditing, they would have this release. Yes, that's it. Keyed out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've had a lot of auditing sessions where I felt very keyed out afterwards. Um, uh, but, but I never did DOT levels. None of my auditing (laughs) sessions were about getting rid of body thetans. I'd never even heard of body thetans until after I'd left Scientology. And I feel where the group delusion actually comes in. And this is super interesting to think about is because because it applied to me as a little Scientologist growing up and a little staff member where every single week at flag graduation, you'd have people who you knew were intelligent, successful people who could, you'd never think that these people are someone who could fall for some BS. And they're getting up there on stage and they're like, this, I, this week I finished OT5 and oh my God, You have to get to this level as fast as you can, no matter what you have to do. I had more gain in every single session of OT5 than the entire um, rest of my lower rest of my bridge combined. And the delusion is to the people who are listening to these success stories, you have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. You can't even conceive what they're talking about because it's confidential nobody knows what's on these right. levels until mm. you're on the levels Interesting. and just to, just imagine decades or, or a, a lifetime of being told that this stuff is so great this stuff is so great this stuff is so great and when you finally get on it how much pressure you have like mentally spiritually psychically for it to also be that great for you because i don't think there's a scientologist on earth who at the lower levels who if you told them Hey, by the way, these upper levels, oh boy, let me tell you, you've got Thetans stuck to you <laughs> and their reactive minds and their painful experiences. It's, it's them that's messing you up. And if yep. you go telepathically audit them, you're going to feel so much better. I don't think there's a Scientologist on earth who would hear that story and go, oh, I want some of that. Right, right. And that's why it's confidential. And that's why we didn't tell the parishioners what was going on that you know, it, that Marlene was just screaming at us constantly. And we were, you know, we had to put smiles on our faces and be shiny, happy people. Right. Because yeah. And we weren't even allowed to talk to each other. We weren't even allowed to think. And back, back to the navel gazing thing. If you, if they can get you doing busy work, being worn down, no sleep, no food, all, all this, and constantly looking within yourself and picking body thetans and, you know, demons and lice off you, they got you, they got you, you know? So you're not, you're not going to run to somebody and say, Hey guys, don't come, don't come here, you know, because you think that you're going to go to hell or you're going to whatever be lost. I don't, I don't know what, if there's a equivalent of hell in Scientology. So there isn't, well, L. Ron Hubbard says, and actually let's compare this because this, let's compare this. This is going to be fun. At least for me, I hope it's fun for you. Yeah. No, I love this shit. The fear (laughs) that they instilled in you as a young person had to do with everything that would happen to you when you die, whether, you know, burning in hell, being beheaded, going to heaven, all this kind of stuff. Well, the dung heap is here. The dung heap is here too. Oh, the dung like heap my kids, was here. My kids were going to end up prostitutes and drug addicts and all that. Yeah. Oh, is the dung heap, by the way, in Vermont? Um, yeah, I think it's right here. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna do some poop emojis. I've been, I've been working on some theta potatoes, but I probably could make some poop emojis. I, st- I, I have a theta potato over, over here. You somewhere. do. One <laughs> yeah, of these days I'm going to create a shelf here of all my little okay. goodies. Can you, can you fit this on it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, oh. he's kind of cuddly though. You could just use him as a pillow, you know. Rodney is really something special there. Yes, um, this one's going to Lara, <laughs> but I'll make more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Scientology sorry. Oh, is sorry. The, this is serious business. Yes. No, that's a Scientology is almost the opposite of that. He says, L. Ron Hubbard says, Earth is the hell. This is, hell. we're in it now. Okay. Right. Pluralism Your day to day life yeah. 
is hell because this is the matrix. You're trapped in your body and you can't get out. Like, could you leave your body right now if you wanted to and go do some remote viewing and come back in? No, but you should be able to. And you're stuck in this body because our evil alien psychiatrist uh, captors have deemed that you as a being were creating too much trouble over in the Galactic Federation that you had to be sent to Earth, which is basically just a prison planet, but that being imprisoned here on Earth in these physical bodies to live lifetime after lifetime with amnesia every new lifetime of your previous life, right, that right. is the hell. Now, compared to the hell of burning for eternity, Earth is not a Earth is not that bad. No, Ignor ignorance might be bliss, as they say <laughs> in the Matrix. Yeah, I mean, in 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 my call in in some Christian circles, it it's just believed that um, this is a fallen nature that God made the earth perfect, but because um, Adam Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which I never understood why that was a bad thing. Because don't you want to know the difference between good and evil? But that's that was bad. They they could eat from every other tree mind you, mm. but they couldn't eat from that tree. And when they did, they realized they were naked. And then all of a sudden, um, God cursed them. Men had to work, um, to toil, um, hard labor for the rest of their life. And that was the curse of men. The women had, that's why we have painful childbirth was because cool. Adam that they ate. Yeah. So interestingly enough for Adam and Eve, ignorance would have been bliss. They weren't supposed to find out the right. truth. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But so it, one of the ways that, that Scientology convinces people that uh, it is worth your time to spend your entire life working for Scientology and getting people up the bridge is they go, after this lifetime, you don't have the privilege of either going to a heaven or a hell and escaping the reality that you exist in. When you die, you're just going to wake up tomorrow in a new baby body. In other words, you are going to inherit the earth in the condition that you left it. And, and, and they'll basically go, are you satisfied or happy with the condition of earth as it is? Everyone will pretty much say in Scientology, no. They'll go, well, are you doing anything to improve it? And they'll, you know, convince you that you're not. And they'll go, do you see how silly that is when you're just going to come back? You're going to keep yeah. coming back to this earth. So you might as well do everything you can to make it a better earth. And the only way that you can do that is by getting people into Scientology. But if this is hell and this is and this is a prison planet and you're just going to wake up in another body, like what's fun about that? Well, no, they want to get you to a point spiritually where well, that's interesting, right? Because 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 yeah. he never says do the bridge so that you can gain the ability to not come back to Earth. Interestingly enough, he says that that's never the pitch. He actually says. Do you really want the conscience of all of your fellow mankind? Uh, do you want th their, you know, them being trapped here for eternity on your conscience? Yeah. Scientologists want to do enough Scientology so that when they come back next lifetime, they can still remember all the Scientology they did in their previous lifetime okay. and pick up right where they left off, helping other people get into Scientology and get up the bridge. It really is their goal to simply get everyone in the world into Scientology. There's no hellfire and damnation afterlife story. Right. It's Earth is there a is, heaven? Is there well? What's Target no. Two? What's all that? What's all? What's Target the, Two is just the next. Target Two is just the next planet to get Scientology started on. Oh, so it never ends. It never so, ends. Once you get everyone on Earth into Scientology, you need to get everyone in the Galactic Federation into Scientology. What's fun about that? There's no it's habit. not fun at all. It sucks. That's why being a Scientology Jeez. staff member just sucks. Like the work never stops and there's never, there's never a win. There's never a success at the end of the, it's just more hours worked, more hours worked, more hours worked, more money raised. There's no ultimate goal. There's no like Nirvana. There's no like, ah, uh, you end up, you're done. You learned all the lessons. That's right. Even when you hear Scientologists talking about clearing the planet, I guess it didn't occur to him that maybe some people thought that once you cleared the planet, there was some afterlife. No, you just go to another, another planet. planet. Yeah. <laughs> it really sucks. Well, I mean, I'm tired from this life. Like I just want to go retire somewhere. This is just bullshit. You yeah. Know? I mean, at least in these wow. other religions, there's some pot of gold at the end of that rainbow yeah so you come back and you get what 21 years and then you just keep coming you keep we come back we come back we come back that's right a billion, and, and for that's a billion why, years what after a billion what if yeah and that's why i've always said 
if Scientologists like to, they, they pat themselves on the back. They think they're so freaking smart that they're the ones who know everything and they're logical and there's no faith. There's no belief. It's just facts and data and information and technology. And I, right. and I go to Scientologists who are in the bubble and I go, guys, L. Ron Hubbard could have done one thing, the easiest thing that he could have done and come back and everyone in the world would join Scientology. If L. Ron Hubbard had just come back, like he's saying all of us are supposed to be able to do. Has he, he could have come back. Have people said they, he, he has. No, there's no Scientologist that believes L. Ron Hubbard has come back. Okay. Jesus has. And he was either. And, 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 and there's a, the, the, the Sea Org members who worked at the international base at that time were told that L. Ron Hubbard was going to come back somewhere around 18 to 21 years later. Miscavige was actually, by all reports, quite paranoid that he had not accomplished some of the things Hubbard told him to. So he believed. Uh, told oh, me. he believed. That's yes, right. that's why okay, when people say, does, L. Ron, does David Miscavige really believe in Scientology? I go, there's plenty of evidence that indicates he does believe. I just think he believes in a different way. He doesn't believe all the bullshit about L. Ron Hubbard. He knows L. Ron Hubbard was a fuck up. Um, I think David Miscavige thinks that he's had to shoulder the burden of fixing a lot of L. Ron Hubbard's mistakes. Yeah. And so he doesn't revere L. Ron Hubbard, but he, in my opinion. But he did, by all reports, believe L. Ron Hubbard was probably coming back. So and he believes in the tech? He believes in the tech. He believes okay. in Thetans. I mean, uh, that's my opinion. Um, and so I go to all the Scientologists. I'm like, Look at the sorry state of Scientology and its horrible reputation in PR. L. Ron, if I was a Scientologist and I believed that L. Ron Hubbard could and should and would uh, be able to come back, I go, I'd have to ask myself, then why didn't he? Because it's the one thing that would prove Scientology is legitimate. And it would right. have been so, if you believe L. Ron Hubbard was full OT and had the ability to yeah. be fully stably exterior at will with full perceptions, and we're supposed to be able to skip the implant station and reincarnate with full recall of our past lives, then why didn't L. Ron Hubbard do that? He could have gone on Good Morning America, come back with his new body and give full total recall of all of his previous lives. People would be lining up outside churches of Scientology to get up that bridge and get the tech mm. of Scientology. Got and, a lot of theories about that. Like, okay, he got, decided to drop his body, right? So maybe he just doesn't feel like coming back. Like he he's got other shit to do. And you know, if if you guys are waiting for him, he's just not he's not gonna do what you tell. Like in in Christianity, it's like more like faith, right? Like God's not gonna, you know, if I say, um, you know, if you God, if you're real, um, you know, heal this person of whatever. If you if you like test him, he's not gonna do it. He'll do it when you least expect it. Yeah, so, of course. so L. Ron's going to come back when you least expect it. So wait, <laughs> you got to be a prepper, be a prepper. But Marilyn, but Marilyn, there is a story for why L. Ron Hubbard hasn't come back. And I'm like, of course, that's the story. And the story is he went off to Target 2 to get Scientology started on another planet in another solar system and yeah. left us the job of clearing Earth. And that's why we have to do it for LRH so that once Earth is clear, Instead of reincarnating on Earth, we can go join him on Target Two and help him clear Target Two. Oh, and I that just and I thought to like myself, bummer. wouldn't wouldn't it have been easier if he actually came back and helped us clear Earth first, and then we all went off to Target Two together? Now, this is why I say Scientologists pat themselves on the back for thinking they're so smart, and you're like, no, the smart thing would have been for L. Ron Hubbard to come back. Don't pretend like that wouldn't have been the best thing for him to do. Can we just confront the fact that the reason he didn't is because this is all a lie. <laughs> this is a scam, folks. No, no. <laughs> you can't think of that because then it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars and years and years and giving up your children. Like Leah always said, it's it's just so true, you know? It's what? It's so true that, that it's oh, a lie, oh, oh, oh. right? It's just oh, it's yeah, true. Yeah. The reason the, the reason why people don't say the hell with this because where do you go you know yeah out yeah. into the uh the w world you know yeah where people are I've terrible some, and they're all going I've to seeing some uh, some really funny yeah, comments in the chat i gotta say uh, I'm, I'm seeing so many familiar names hi everybody so good so good to see you i was afraid i was scared to death to even look at the chat i was like but uh, i love all well, here, let's <laughs> let's uh let's look at some of the comments yeah um, totally and actually, the way we have this shared right now, are you able to start comments or no? I don't, I don't know. I don't think you might not be. No, able to. I just, I'm trying to click on Purple Groovy said LRH is a planet slumlord. I agree. <laughs> and hi, Purple Groovy. Hi, everybody. Rev Girl. Rev Girl, do you know her? 
I don't know. Oh, uh, she's an ex Scientologist. She's super cool. Oh, okay. I see her. her uh, I see her in the chat. Yeah, she always sign, sends wine and chocolates. Emojis. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so Dave Owens says Rod is taller than David Miscavige. You know what? Yeah, he totally is. Where did my little Davy guy go? I don't know. He's somewhere. He fell. But yeah, he definitely is. Definitely is. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Um, okay. I hope you don't get, you're not going to, you're not going to get like demonetized for that. Right. It's just a golden rod with some feet. Oh no. I'm pretty sure it's already demonetized. That's okay. Oops. (laughs) There is Brad Cotter. There is a fanatical Catholic group TFP in my town. Interesting. Well, that reminds me of the question I asked you. Um, was there a particular thing that you guys were told and believed as to why she had the unique ability or, or uniquely knew the right way. I mean, I, I know I asked it. I just don't know. What was, what was okay. the answer? Uh, because, well, it's not that nobody else had the truth. She did She did um, have some other, well, cults, some other communes that she, she um, had said that they had the truth too. But then she always had following outs with them because she couldn't share power and she couldn't take any advice. Right. So, uh, yeah, even she was ordained. I don't even know to this day if my marriage is legal, but it's 26 years later. So I assume it is, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, she, she just got like sort of ordained from some other cult, but yeah, I, I think it was, she had these revelations and you can, I don't, I don't even know the answer to that, except that she did take some of the writings you know early on um if anybody knows like who charles spurgeon uh, some of the old the the old like martin luther um you probably heard of lutherism right that was the big that was the big break off um, from the catholic church in the 1500s it was uh martin luther um he basically started the whole protestant uh sect or religion and from that branched off Methodists, Lutherans, um, Baptists, all, all of them, all, all the is and the uh, uh, Oscals, <laughs> all of them, <laughs> like Amazing. Episcopalian, Episcopals, and the uh, Pentecostals, and yeah. Wow. Dave Owen says, what would Jesus do came from a book called His Steps from 1896. I didn't know that. This is the other thing where Scientologists pat themselves on the back for being so logic-based and analytical and just it's all facts. And you go, except they have some, uh, uh, except right in front of their face is this thing that L. Ron Hubbard said that in any situation, what you should ask yourself is what would Ron do? You go, and you convince yourself that we don't worship this guy. Like it's literally what the Christians right. say about Jesus. Jesus. We're oh, saying yeah. it about Ron, well, but we don't worship him. Jesus. Only, well, I'm only sorry. lowly faith based religions sorry, worship but people. That big stage, it reminded me of an evangelical um Christian, you know, one of those those televangelist uh mega churches, right? And you got Tom Cruise with the big, you know, metal, flavor flav, you know, plate gold plate on him. And then he's like, sir, and he's got a big picture of of Elron. That's yeah. I mean, that's worship. That's worship. That's worship. Um, Abigail S. says, God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They Mm -hmm. took an apple from that tree and ate it. So apples aren't the significance, but eating from the forbidden tree is. Yes. Yeah. Could have been a pomegranate. Sorry to tell you. Could have been a persimmon. Never had a persimmon, but. Yeah, I'm not sure I've ever had a persimmon either. Okay, Lori Plays says, Marilyn, thanks for sharing your story with Aaron's Peeps. You are an awesome human being. Love you, Lori. Thank you. She's great. Uh, Barbara Mangan. Oh, um, God. <laughs> oh, Marilyn, so glad you got out and are telling your story. Uh, this Love is. You, Barbara. Oh, oh, it's Nat- Natalie. Natalie. Hi. Oh my God. Talk about a uh, amazing story. I was just like, my jaw was on the floor listening to what four hours of your story, Natalie. You're amazing. And it's so good. Natalie. Why, how are you guys so well-spoken? I'm just up here like, whoa, oh my God. I'm, I can't even talk. But you guys Natalie are and awesome. I are doing another video later this evening. All right. Awesome. Oh, so she goes, yeah, so true, Aaron. We got so good at giving a good success story or risk having to redo things. Okay, yeah. that's another component of the, yep. the mass delusion, the group delusion. Yep. 
it's enforced on you. You're not allowed to do your next step until we're satisfied with how much you've said this step helped you. Yeah. yeah. And Scientologists I mean, don't want to just lie about yeah. it. They don't right. want to just lie about it. They want it to actually have helped them. Do you think you make it like yes. make it go right? You make it happen like in your mind? Yes. Convince yourself, yes. right? All part yes. of the indoctrination. Yeah. Absolutely. Barbara like, Mangano, uh, you both live through similar things, yet in different cults. Yeah. Wild, huh? Did Can you I ask read... you something real quick? Oh, go ahead. I know we have some, we we should do another stream. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, did you did you feel like you know when you when you left, right? Did you have some uh, guilt? I don't know how to how to call it what to call it, but I think um. Uh, I've heard it's called moral injury, like where you were kind of made all the, the shit that, that, that inflicted on you, where for the cause you had to inflict that abuse on others to a degree. Say it again. I mean, okay. So like, okay. So you were sucked, right? And you were treated bad. Were you used as a vehicle to treat others badly? Like, um, I mean, I know you weren't in charge. Like you didn't put anybody in the RPF and you didn't do any of that. You didn't cover up crimes or whatever. But me, I didn't, I didn't do any of that either. I didn't do crimes. But all this the shit that happened to me, um, I would have to like kind of uh I don't know, like inflict it on others, like, oh, fasting's great. Yeah. Or oh yeah, you gotta take this bucket of ammonia and and you you need to for Jesus, you need to wipe 500 spice stars with straight ammonia as it's going up your nose, right? Wow. Or um, you have to, you know, pray, fast and pray on your face, uh, prostrate on your face, right? Um, those were all horrible things. Oh, you have a demon of this. You, you, you know, so I don't know. So I did feel a lot of guilt about it because, um, mm. I honestly feel like not the flash McGemma. I honestly feel like crocheting kind of saved my sanity because I was able to have something tangible to, 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 to uh, and I do it on my stream. Sometimes I'll crochet, um, just to like focus on where I didn't get out of my body because people were literally going insane and being hospitalized. And for some right. reason, my husband and I, Duncan, um, he would go like jump in a lake or something that was acceptable. Like we didn't have any acceptable outlets except for a couple of things. Um, right. Swimming, walking you know, when, and crocheting. When you hear about here, uh, Anon is making a comment here about like enforcing conditions and shaming people. So when you hear about <clears throat> the things the parts of people's Scientology experience that were the most abusive to them. Uh, and I can't, I, I, I can't generalize for all stories, but it mostly has to do with things that happened with the, either, like if it was physical abuse or sexual right. abuse, or right. if it was um, things that the ethics officer was enforcing or also um, hardships due to the crazy fundraising. I was in a sense, very, very lucky that my job in Scientology was only ever related to delivering courses to people who someone else had already gotten them to pay for right. and somebody else had already convinced them to come in and do it. And then it was yeah. my job to either help them get through that course or to supervise the people who were helping them get through that course. Now I know right. Louis Repetto is in the chat and he's one of the people who worked, um, who was a course supervisor at ASHA when I was, the tech sec there. And so, um, the things like, as far as the bad behavior that was expected of me on my post was really limited to like, I don't know, screaming at people. Uh, Louis Repetto will get a kick out of me, particularly remembering how much I screamed at Anna Dementov. She was a horrible Sea Org member, Lewis. Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know, screw so, her then you can yell but, at her. <laughs> but, the but the truth is, and I, I wonder how many people who worked under me in the Sea Org would, would agree with this, is that one of the reasons I succeeded on my particular post the way that I did is I was actually particularly good at getting people to rally for the cause. Mm, and yeah. the most effective way to get people to rally for the cause is not with threats of punishment and shame and humiliation. Like it's not a very effective motivator. Mm -hmm. And I never, like, I never, um, uh, despite some stories you'll hear of me getting into some physical confrontations with like a Sea Org security guard or whatever. Um, I'm not someone who ever, uh, controlled people in the Sea Org through physical violence. Like I, I never hit anybody in the Sea Org. 
Um, I screamed at Bill Screevers a lot. I screamed at Jim Plett a lot. I screamed at Dave Hordell a lot. I um, <laughs> and the other thing about like course rooms, you're not allowed to yell in course rooms. Um, and I wonder if <laughs> Louis Repetto, if you're in the chat. Um, oh, uh, I see. I'm <laughs> leaving Scientology. Okay. Anna Dementov, do you remember our yelling match in the hallway about me demanding to go to the RPF? <laughs> I don't actually you remember that. Wanted remember to go? <laughs> Uh, wow. I don't, I, I, now that you mentioned that I, I vague, I get a vague impression of something. Um, oh yeah. Cause letting us court, cause Lewis was a course supervisor on the briefing course, which was a, a major auditor course. And it's funny because in some ways these supervisors had such, um, a controlled and restricted life and job. Mm. And they weren't given a lot of freedoms, and yet they were kind of the lifeblood of what we delivered as an organization. Like losing a supervisor was almost unthinkable. And yet you'd think that if we wanted to hold on to these core supervisors, we would treat them really, really, really well. Yeah. And yet they weren't treated right. well. It's just this weird right. way the organization behaves. Mm. And so, um, Louis, I'm, I'm curious. Um, <laughs> If you want to say in the chat, like, what's the worst thing you remember me doing? Because honestly, it's just screaming at people who weren't complying. And I'm not even brushing. Like, Let's do a tell-all, Louis Repetto. Of and so, you know, I, screaming at people isn't good. But when you hear people talking about their horrible Scientology stories, it's usually not just someone yelled at me. Um, no, yeah. Yeah. And yet it became yeah. very clear to me that that's how, that's how John Lundin, our captain, uh, dealt with his juniors. That's how my senior, Andrea Butterworth, would uh, Andrea Lewis Butterworth would deal with me sometimes. And it very quickly became clear that the way to not be in trouble with your seniors is to treat your juniors the way your seniors treat people. And that way they will see you as being in the in group instead of the out group. And it is true that I, I let me see, <laughs> Lewis said, I can attest Aaron was a shouter. <laughs> really? His 50 foot TR1 is impeccable. Yelling back at John Lundin in the exec office was the worst I've seen of you. Yes. Is that what you do to and ashtrays? What's TR1? So like TR1 is ashtray? when you're – so there's different versions of it. So um, uh, yelling at the ashtray is actually TR8. Oh, um, TR1 okay. is so just you... reading – TR1 is reading uh, lines out of Alice in Wonderland. Oh, wow. But 50-foot yeah. TR1 is when you stand 50 feet – oops, I hit my – 50 feet away from each other and read lines out of Alice in Wonderland. And you're supposed to be able to speak naturally and be, be heard. Wow. Yeah, yeah. actually, Lewis, I'm not sure I've ever heard someone mention 50 foot. Alice in Wonderland. Before. That's just gibberish. That's actually <laughs> That's why, why he picked that book. Yes. Yeah. Um, the whole, um, uh, you know, the Doug Kramer, uh, bless him. Uh, uh, rest in peace, Doug. He was talking about the clay, the clay tables, the claymation, and and the and the thing with Alice in Wonderland. Um, like what do they call it? Like infantilized, like um having you be like a child. It's actually a, a scripture mm. verse. Like um, you cannot enter the kingdom in he of heaven unless you you become like a child. That's another. That's another tactic. That's another thing that was in my cult and also in Scientology is just having you accept these crazy behaviors, this crazy language, this crazy stuff. But you know, training routines are fairly, fairly at the beginning, right? So when you end up in OT three or whatever, learning about Xenu, you're already playing with clay. You're already yelling, screaming, uh, Alice in Wonderland. You know, I mean, that's the shit we were doing too. Like yeah. not that. The thing about the similar, TRs similar. is that they repeat at pretty much every level of Scientology. You can do them at really? the as the first thing when you walk in the door. Then you do them when you're doing your professional auditor training. And then once you are a professional auditor, if it's your job to audit people, you do TRs every single day of your life. Most Scientologists, most professional auditors have – Alice in Wonderland memorized. It's hard to it's hard to flip through the book and 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 pick a line that you're not sick of saying already. Uh, yeah, Brillig. Yeah, I don't I don't know much of it. <laughs> I can I can I can quote scripture though. I can tell you where rainbows came from, and it has nothing to do with uh, refracted light or anything. It has to do with uh, a stinky old ark that could not have fit all those things in there. Yes, a boat. And all that. And that's where God, you know, because he promised, sent the rainbow, promised that he would not destroy the earth with flood ever again. But fire is still on the table. 
Just saying. Fire is still on the table. Fire is on the table. Uh, Jilbo Baggins says, you know who needs a crochet poo? <laughs> oh, my goodness, Jobo. Yes. I love you, honey. <laughs> All right. Yes. I won't, I won't blow up your spot, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> Uh, Natalie says, that's what I should have said when I left the Sea Org. I'm going ahead to work on Target 2. Why not? There you go. You know, uh, some people have asked me if I ever thought Scientology could end in a, in a, Jim, a Jim Jones, People's Temple, mass, you know, mass death scenario. Yeah. And based on Scientology's lack of belief in some greater afterlife, I've always said no. But I said there's one exception. And I don't think this would ever happen, but I just feel like the exception would be. Mm -hmm. If for some reason Miscavige published some edict that um, uh, he'd heard from L. Ron Hubbard. Yep. And, and by the way, that's the other thing. Scientologists believe they can all, uh, on the, once they're OT, telepathically communicate with other beings. How come David Miscavige can't telepathically communicate with L. Ron Hubbard? He's never claimed to. Okay. So if right. Miscavige said, I heard, mm -hmm. I heard from L. Ron, and he said, the Sykes have won Earth. The, the, it's a lost cause. We all need to go join him on target two. Right. If he said Isn't that, it? there yeah. is a large chunk of Scientologists who would drop the body oh. to go join Ron on target two. I um, believe that because the thing is, you know, these are just meat bodies with us. It was just a, you're just a vessel. You're just an empty vessel. Yes. Right. Um, in heaven's gate, you're a, you're a vehicle. Heaven's gate. You, you look at the beliefs, not too far off from our crazy shit. Honestly, wow. but the only reason wow. why we know about it, 32 people is because that's how they end it. Right. And you guys have Tom Cruise, you, get, you know, <laughs> Dora Pope just has me with, you know, just crochet and shit. I don't know, but yeah, Marlene Sweeney. I just want you guys to know that name. <sighs> Marlene Sweeney. Thank you. <laughs> Blow drill. This is Dylan Gill in the chat. If you want a hey, map of target Dylan. two, hit that like button. All right. <laughs> Excellent advice. Uh, Nancy Stitch and keep fighting the Hi, good Nancy. fight. Too. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, Jem's journey was also accused of having a Jezebel spirit. You don't look. See, look, she's so she looks so sweet. Yeah, bullshit. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Um, you know, because in Scientology, the whole body thetan thing is confidential. You can't run around accusing people of having bad body thetans. Um, oh. but you but it's interesting. Them. It's interesting though. Like, look, as, as someone who grew up in Scientology, I never even conceived that there was a possibility that another Thetan could be the source of your problems. That's not even something that truly makes sense in Scientology. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you get to that level and L. Ron Hubbard is now introducing this thing that a lot of Scientologists by report when they first read this, they're like, are you effing kidding me right now? And yet this group delusion thing comes in and is like, I, uh, sometimes I've heard the core supervisor on OT3 even tells people, you don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe right. it. Right. Yeah. You just, just have, have faith. to audit the procedure. <laughs> we always just, just hold it faith. Yeah. Just audit the, yeah. just audit the procedure. Yeah. But can I ask you something though? Um, yeah. Haven't you already been told that your mind has like two different, like with us, it was the sin nature because of Adam and Eve and all that. Uh, we had what was called an old man that would be like trying to um, get you to not be walking in the spirit. So you had the Holy Spirit that would speak in, in your mind and your, your new person that when you, when you come up from the water of a baptism, that's where you're supposed to be walking in the spirit. Then you've got basically dividing yourself. We had the, the sin nature they called the old man, which was like the reactive mind. It was um, something like the devil on your shoulder telling you what to do, right? Which wasn't good because you're not walking in the spirit. You're not walking in the new person that you're meant to be, right? So you're just going insane because it's like, is this, is this my old man? Is this my reactive mind? Is this this, you know, blah, 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 blah. So you're already like, um, kind of, if they can get you like, again, navel gazing, looking within and saying, Oh, I, I've got all this. It, it can set up a conflict. It's like, hey, I got an answer. I didn't even know I had a problem. I didn't even know I was I was born, you know, this or that, or with you know body thetans or whatever. They they inflict the the injury on you. They tell you what's wrong with you, and guess what? They've got the solution. You know, right? Every that's call right. I know of every call I know of does that. So L. Ron Hubbard's version of that is telling you that what's wrong with you is your reactive mind. Mm -hmm. And only through Dianetics auditing can you get rid of the reactive mind. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons that appeals to a certain amount of people at a certain level is because you're being told that what's wrong with you is something that's actually not your fault. 
you're not responsible for the fact that you, you're not to blame for the fact that you have right. a reactive mind. Yep. And, and we're giving yeah, you a blame solution. Adam and Eve. We, I, I blamed Adam and Eve, you know? Yeah. <laughs> now what's crazy is that it turns out that at the end of your Dianetics auditing, you're actually supposed to realize that you are actually the one who created your own reactive mind. So the realization that they call the clear cognition is, right. is you go, I just realized I've been mocking up. Mocking up is a Scientology word that just means creating mentally. Um, I just yeah. realized I've been mocking up my own reactive mind all along and I'm not doing it anymore. <sighs> Boom. You're clear. Your reactive mind is gone. And, now wait, is this um, when you're clear? Is this when you, you go clear or is this an OT8 or whatever? Like what, what no, level is this? That's going clear. Okay, that's going clear. Gotcha. Oh. And so then from a Scientology perspective, you're supposed to believe that, hey, the one thing that was making me less than a perfect being or a perfect computer is erased. I'm perfect now. And then you'll oh, wait, go, were you tricked? Were you tricked? Who? I know. Were you were you tricked? Like your reactive mind was there or what wasn't? I don't know. That's the I didn't thing. Follow. It's like you didn't know you didn't know you had a reactive mind until yeah. L. Ron Hubbard said you did. No, right. and then and then no, and then no, clear. you really did have one, but you only had one because you were creating it constantly. Oh, interesting. He said you're, wow. you're, you're yeah, you're supposed to realize, oh, I was the one continuously creating this thing. If I just stop creating it, it will go away. And you go, Yeah, but you didn't even know you were creating it until L. Ron Hubbard told you that you had one. Anyway, it's this weird thing, right? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any sense because it isn't real, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how with the con conclusion I've come to. I, I don't know. Like, you know, people ask me, are you spiritual? Do you believe in anything? Honestly, I threw, you know, baby G. I threw the baby out with the bathwater. And then, you know, <laughs> I might take something back. Like, okay, um, the Bible says God is love. All right. I can do that. But whatever. You know, I, I believe in love, right? But um, all I know is that I don't know. You know, that's all I know is I don't know. And that's what I know. So I, I can't pretend. I can't pretend to believe in anything, you know? And I tell my kids, my, my son was so scared to tell me he had been, <laughs> he had been sneaking on the internet and um, <laughs> this was, you know, he's 20, he's 21 now. He'll be 22 this week. But he was uh, entered sort of like a SPTV type thing like 10 years ago but it was an atheist I, I can't remember the name of the guy uh, somebody probably knows that one of the biggest atheist channels and he started listening to him and uh he he understands all the ins and outs of these co communities so he's just like mom just do your own self you know just ignore the trolls like he, he tells me how to how to navigate this now and he knows all the all the emojis but anyways um i <laughs> He knows all this stuff. I ask him, like, where'd you hear that, mom? On the internet. So anyways, the, the atheism thing, he was so afraid to tell me that he was an atheist because he thought I was going to be like, oh, my per oh, my rhinestones. Oh, my rhinestones. You know, like, but I was just like, hey, listen, honey, I don't want you to pretend to believe in God if you don't, you know, it's just like done with that. Done with that. That's so, good. So you I threw baby Jesus out with the bathwater. I kind of did. I, I think, um, and I, I still do have a nativity uh, and we put it up every year. Um, I don't know what I believe. Maybe, maybe Jesus is real. It's, it's, I'm not making fun of anybody and it's a tradition. I might crochet a baby Gertie, a little, little Gertie to put next to the Lord in the manger. That sounds cool. You know? <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Brad Cotter says TFP wants to dissolve the separation of church and state. Oh, that was the, um, the organization he referred to previously. Um, I think it was, okay. a an extremist TFP. group that he mentioned earlier. Oh, oh that's right. Yeah. The Catholic. Yeah. <clears throat> I so Hi, love Lathenda. that Marilyn is telling her story. Comparing different cults and the similarities is very educating. It shows red flags to many people. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I've started to give um, uh, particular advice to Scientology, uh, people who want advice on how to maybe get their Scientology friends to wake up. And I say, have them watch documentaries about other, other cults. Because cult. Absolutely. Absolutely. A Scientologist will not be offended at sitting, being, mm -hmm. uh, oh, my, oh, you got to watch this Nexium documentary. They're such a cult. cult. Oh, my God. Yeah. Totally right. Scientology yep. won't be defensive about that because they don't think they are a cult. But when they start yep. watching that, they're going to go, oh. <gasps> Are we the baddies? Yeah. 
Yeah. And I'll go one step further, not only helping you leave a cult because you realize you're, you're in one, but also just the, de the deconstructing and deprogramming. It helped me because um, I had such a hard time. Like I really like Derek Lambert, but I can't watch his channel that much because um, you know, when he has apologists and stuff on the language was just triggering. Right. Mm. But, you know, we had our crazy language and, and it was taken to extreme. So it was very triggering to me. But you guys have a crazy language, not triggering to me. So but the, but again, the similarities were so um, so uncanny that it really did help me to deprogram and, and see the tactics and everything that happened to me. So that's awesome. Lathanda says, Aaron, remember, uh, there was a person hiding under a desk from you. <laughs> you crossed the line there and did not put your manners back in. Bad AA run. There's this hilarious story they tell in. on my on my hate website, which oh, is oh, oh. If it was a real story, I'd pull up the report and share it with you guys, but it's a fake story. I mean, me chasing someone around the org and then they hide in my senior's office and hide under her desk. And it's um, I feel like she's talking about Ben Francis for some reason, but I'm I don't know. I don't know. I'm just I, oh, I was thinking of a different Ben. Um, so uh, there's no fax ben machines Monahan. involved. No, no fax machines involved in this. Oh, that's story? Dan. Dan O'Connor is the fax oh, machine. Oh, Dan. Okay, time. different. Okay. Okay. Who's the who's the other guy named Ben? Was that the one you Ben Monahan? Like? Oh, that's right. Right. I do listen. I just I gotta take notes. I gotta take notes. <laughs> um, fancy pants are N. Listening to Marilyn brings up fancy much pants. of my childhood. Um, thankfully my parents left, but at nearly 50, I'm still realizing the landmines of trauma that I find. Yeah. Wow. I, I get it. I get you. Yeah. I'll be oh, I think, you know, this gentleman. Oh my God. Hi, honey. Uh, finally home. Oh, you're home. I didn't hear the dogs. Uh, you went <laughs> to the dentist. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Hi, Duncan. You can um, bring me some Will, more coffee if you want. <laughs> Sorry. Will Gunn, mainstream believers, a little self-reflection. I'm not, I only think I know what this means. Is this comment directed at mainstream believers? Possibly. It could be. Oh, well, I, you know. Anybody can believe whatever they want as long as they don't hurt people or children or indoctrinate people or shove it down your throat. That's all I can. I know. agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, um, yeah, let's do more. Let's do more chats like this. Yeah. Yeah. I have so many more questions for you. <laughs> I know you, you were interviewing me? me. Well, yeah, like I, a lot of them. Because <laughs> when, sure. when you were talking, I was like, mm, you know, but. I'll, I'll write them down. Well, you know we'll what? do another one. Let, let's do another video where you ask yeah. me questions. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. <sighs> Guys, thank you so much for hanging out with us thank this you, afternoon. Everybody. Thank you, as always, to everyone who watches until the very end. And we'll talk to you Bye, soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay. If you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, dancing for my love. Then you could click right in fight here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe.